Hey everyone, welcome in. It is a Tuesday edition. This is being recorded late on Tuesday because I was been waiting for the Texans to release their final 53-man roster. They finally did it, or at least they released the, the list of everybody who got cut and by process of elimination, able to piece together the 53-man roster. So I uh, wanted to get with you guys today, kind of go through some of my thoughts on that. And also, let's do a mailbag as well. So I don't know how big this episode is going to be time-wise, but I've got a, a decent mailbag in front of me here from you guys. So we'll hit uh, the 53-man roster, my thoughts on that, and a handful of mailbag questions as well. A reminder to subscribe, rate, and review uh, the podcast. Hit that subscribe button. Season's going to be here in less than two weeks. I don't know what more to tell you except subscribe. It makes it easier on uh, on everybody. Um, a reminder as well, H-O-U, where, there we go, H-O-U mailbag at gmail.com is how you can send me an email. Um, we're going to do a mailbag next Tuesday. Um, this week, I've got some family business to attend to out of town later this week. So I'm going to have an interview later this week with Ian O'Connor, who's the author of the Aaron Rodgers book that just came out that's been getting a lot of run. Um, he and I talked for about 20 or 30 minutes and I'm going to run that interview later this week. Really interesting conversation. Amazing. The work and the amount of interviews that went into that book. It's absolutely incredible. So um, Ian O'Connor, you'll get my conversation with him dropping um, later this week. So uh, and then we started up like a normal game week next week. Mailbag on Tuesday, preview Thursday ish. And then um, a recap after the game is over. Hopefully a Texans win on Sunday at Indianapolis. It's here. So let's do it. Um, so thoughts on the 53-man roster. I, as you guys know, I predicted my own 53-man roster uh, earlier this week, and I was pretty close. I got 47 out of the 53, and three of the ones I got wrong were actually guys that went to injured reserve. So I was pretty close on this thing. Um, the only ones that I got wrong that I had making the team that didn't make it were Case Keenum, who went on IR, uh, Cam Irving, who instead Nick Broker made the team, Kurt Heinisch, who went on IR and instead um, Tim Settle made the team, uh, Christian Harris went on IR and instead Jamal Hill made the team, according to my 53. And then I got the last two corners wrong, and I think that's pretty indicative of the fact that cornerback might be a position where they're not done yet. Chris Boyd and Jeff Okuda made the roster. I had CJ Henderson and Mike Ford making the final roster. Um, so I was pretty close on this stuff. Uh, you know, I had Keenum making it as a third quarterback. Turns out they're they're gonna run with two quarterbacks, at least for the time being. And they did, they did, I guess, technically include a fullback. I had no fullback on the roster, but they kept undrafted rookie British Brooks who played some fullback late in the training camp in practice and then did a nice job in the Rams game in the snaps he got at fullback. That was enough for him to make the 53-man roster. So they didn't want to mess around with putting him through waivers and the fact he might get picked up. He earned a spot on the roster, and he's going to get it. Um, so uh, so the, the 53, I'm not going to go through the entire 53. I'm just going to kind of go down the list here and the stories that I find interesting. I'll start with running back. Damian Pierce does end up making the team as does Cam Akers. So anybody worried that Damian Pierce was going to make the team at the expense of them cutting Cam Akers, they may have a blind spot for Damian Pierce, but they don't have a – they being Nick Casario and D'Amico Ryans, they may have a blind spot for Damian Pierce, but they don't have a blind spot for good when they see it. And Cam Akers was good in training camp. He deserves to be on this team. Now, the, the fun thing will be when the first depth chart comes out is if Damian is still on the team, because I think there's still a chance he gets traded. Um, and I think that may be part of the reason they kept British Brooks on the team is they they realize he can play a little bit of fullback, but also um, if they're going to move Pierce, then Brooks is on the depth chart as a running back, as the third running back, probably behind Mixon and Akers. Dario Gumbawale makes the team, but I don't look at him as a running back. I think he's kind of a he's kind of a uh, a um, a special teams slash you know. Uh, there we go. I'm trying to get the right graphic on YouTube there. Um, special teams slash uh, like spot use running back. So both Akers and Damian Pierce make the team. So everybody can calm down at least for a few days until we figure out what exactly they think of Damian. If the first depth chart comes out and Damian's listed behind Mixon and then Akers is behind Damian, don't freak out. Okay. Don't freak out. 
Um, wide receiver, they end up keeping seven. I actually got that entire position group correct. John Mechie, who looked like he was in some bit of danger a few weeks ago of not making it, he makes the team, as does Xavier Hutchinson, Robert Woods, and Steven Sims as the return specials to go with the big three. Um, I got the tight end position correct as well with all three tight ends. That one wasn't too hard. Schultz, Stover, and Jordan. They end up cutting Tegan Catoriano. They end up cutting Noah Brown, too. I don't mean to turn this into the Sean Got Everything Right podcast, but I've been saying for two weeks that they should cut Noah Brown because he can't stay healthy. They cut Noah Brown. Everybody out there saying, you got to keep Noah Brown. You got to keep two big games last year. That's awesome. He's never on the field. So um, so Noah Brown is gone. Um, as far as the other, the other concerns or things on the 53-man roster that jump out at me, um, again, congrats to British Brooks making the team. I mean, that is... That's like a dude in WWE, you know, that's like a guy stealing the money in the bank briefcase when he's not even climbed up the ladder yet one time during the match. Wrestling nerds know what I'm talking about. This is like somebody out of nowhere just at the last second. It's like when you're, we can all relate to this. It's like when you're watching the Taco Bell packets running around Minute Maid Park or the, the presidents at a Washington Nationals game or the sausages at the Brewers game. You know, they got those big guys in the sausage costumes. And it's like two of them are way out in front. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, in comes mild on the Taco Bell packets and wins the thing. British Brooks is mild in this whole thing. Or Teddy Roosevelt in the president race or whatever, however you want to say it. Just out of nowhere. Like he was looking like a practice squad guy through and through. And then between a combination of looking really good against the Giants in the third preseason game in the fourth quarter, and being able to play a little bit of fullback, he's on this team. So we'll see how long it lasts. Ride that wave, British Brooks. You do you. Um, Will Anderson Jr., not on injured reserve. That's good. He made the team. Obviously, he made the team. But he's, unlike Christian Harris, not having to go on short-term injured reserve. The two guys they're using their short-term injured reserve exemptions on, because there's you can, use, you can put two guys on injured reserve before the 53-man is set and bring those guys back during the season, Kurt Heinisch and Christian Harris. So we'll see what Heinish, I think, dinged up his knee. This Harris thing is concerning me. Linebacker is not a deep position for this team at all. And Christian Harris being out for all of training camp. This reminds me a lot of his rookie year when he missed training camp and didn't play till like week six. And he sucked that year. He was terrible. Um, now, at least we've got evidence of him being a good football player late last season. But this Christian Harris injury is a concern. My other thoughts on the 53-man roster is that I, I I don't think they're done at cornerback. I don't think this team goes into week one with um, with Chris Boyd and Jeff Okuda as cornerbacks on this team. Okuda maybe, just based on traits. I just think that there's more work to be done at that position. That, that position is real thin after the first two guys, in my opinion. Um, I think that's part of the reason why they've got Jalen Petrie playing a little slot corner right now is they don't feel like they've got anybody that's great. You know, Miles Bryant did some good things in camp. Um, Desmond King got cut. That's an annual tradition officially now. He's been cut twice in um he's been cut twice in uh, after after training camps this year and last year. So that's about it. I mean, like I said, for, I got 47 of the 53, so there's no major surprises to me here. Um and I'm again, I'm not surprised that Akers and Pierce both made it. That's what I had on Sunday. What will be interesting to see is what they do at quarterback because Case Keenum is on season-long injured reserve. He's out for the year. So they've only got two quarterbacks right now. I can see them bringing Tim Boyle back and putting him on the practice squad. Um, I think there will be another quarterback in this building. I don't know if he'll be on the 53, but I think they're going to pick up a quarterback when they put the practice squad together. I'd be shocked if they did. If, if for no other reason, you need somebody to run the scout team. So there will be a quarterback on, on that practice squad, and it remains to be seen, I guess, if it'll be Tim Boyle. So that's about it for the 53. I think, again, you know, like the toughest cuts, um, you know, for me, I didn't have British Brooks making it. He was among my last four out. Um, Ali Gay not making it. I'm not shocked by that. I didn't have him on my 53, but I think they really want to bring him back on the practice squad. And I think they, I think, they think there might be something there with Ali Gay down the road. He was an undrafted free agent last year, and obviously he's a guy that's got a lot of physical traits, long arms, um, just very big. Like, he sticks out. When you see number 90, you notice him. So that's about it for the 53-man roster. I'm definitely curious your thoughts 
Um, send me an email and we can hash through it next week. H O U mailbag at gmail.com. We got two weeks, a little under two weeks until the opener. So we got plenty of time to hash this stuff out and talk it through. Um, that's the 53 man roster. All right, let's get to the mailbag. Um, done with my thoughts on the 53. And, uh, this is from David Sean to me more than anything about the Texans is that we finally have a real GM. Rick Smith was just horrible after 2011, though he gets credit for Watson. But what about Brock? What pick after the second round was ever useful from Rick Smith? Overpaying for Tunsil? Okay, well, that was not on Rick Smith. That Rick Smith was gone by then. That was Bill O'Brien. And he says, OMG, B-O-B. Um, we have a team with depth, and it's not top-heavy, praying that the stars don't get hurt. We're arguing and agonizing about the fourth running back and fifth receiver. Guess my question is, what changed, or is Nick that good? Nick Casario is very good. I think it's really helped Nick Casario, who I think I, I think is I think he was good before D'Amico Ryan's got here. I know the record didn't reflect it, but Nick inherited just a brutal, brutal situation. Um, I love the combination of the two of them, though. I think D'Amico is the perfect guy to put alongside Nick because I think Nick thinks pretty analytically. I think he's got a good eye for talent, but I think having D'Amico there to be able to help really really vet the guys that fit what he wants culturally is just a, a, it's a really dynamic and exciting combination, those two. So I don't know that it's just Nick. I think it's both of them. I think it's the combination of Nick and D'Amico. The only thing I would take umbrage with David on Rick Smith, I wouldn't say he was just horrible after 2011. I, he gets credit for Deshaun Watson, which was a good pick until, you know, Deshaun decided that his muscles hurt. Um, and, uh, and I, and I thought, you know, look, Rick Smith did an amazing job drafting in the first round of the draft for the most part. Um, that's a lot of times as we saw, that's enough to keep you employed for a while. So I don't think he was horrible. I think I honestly, and neither guy's going to like to hear this because I'm comparing the two of them and they hate each other, but Bill O'Brien and Rick Smith are very similar in that. I think both were average at their jobs. I think Rick Smith was an average GM. He was a GM over a team that on his watch started out for a few years going eight and eight and eight and eight, and nine and seven. And then they spiked up for a couple of years. And then they had a disastrous 2013. They pivoted to O'Brien. And then they were nine and seven, nine and seven, nine and seven. And then the last year, obviously, was when Deshaun got hurt. And that was a disaster. So I I think Bill O'Brien and Rick Smith, I don't think either of them were horrible at their jobs they were brought in for. Um, O'Brien was an abysmal GM. He was a miserable, horrible GM, but he was an average NFL coach. I think Rick Smith was an average NFL GM. Um, Bobby in the Hill Country. Uh, okay, now Bobby's asking me this before the roster was set. Um he said, do you think the final 53-man roster is all currently in camp with the Texans? Thanks for the podcast. I look forward to every episode and the new insights every time. Um, Bobby, I'll answer this one. I kind of did in going through the 53-man, but I, I think for sure that the Texans are going to be going through some of the recyclables for other teams. You know, Some of the other guys that got waived. You, it, now, you need to do it quick. They got to do it tonight. By the time you're listening to this, who knows? They may put in waiver claims on people, and you might, you know, they, they this roster may have already changed by the time some of you are listening to this. But I think cornerback, I think linebacker, I think uh, potentially the depth on the offensive line, I think those are three spots. And I, they may be in the market for a quarterback, too, a third-string quarterback. Those are all the places I think that they might be kind of walking around, walking up to people's trash cans like the recyclable bin and just looking and going, oh, okay. I don't know why they're throwing this away. This is a perfectly good samurai machete. Why would you throw this away? Why would you put this in the garbage? You know what I mean? Like one man's trash is another man's samurai machete, the old saying. Um, so, yeah, I, I think they're still shopping. I think Nick and his team are working overtime tonight. All right, Matthew. Matthew K., my man. He said, I realize all games are counted equally in those such things. However, we all know certain games are labeled as big games, and we usually can agree that a game, that a game is, is a big game. That being said, my question to you, Sean, is this. What are the five regular season games that will define the Texans' season? Short and sweet, let me hear it. All right, I'm going to need to wet the whistle before this one. I thought about this one. 
I think there's five games that are the season defining games for this team. I think it starts week one at Indianapolis. To me, that's the hardest division game on the schedule. And that sets the tone. You win that Indianapolis game and you are looking at a patch of schedule that is conducive to getting to, I think, six and two to start the season. They go at Indy. They win that one. You should beat the Bears at home. You should beat the Vikings on the road. I would say you should at worst split with Jacksonville and Buffalo the next two weeks. I mean, you're home for both those games, so you're going to be favored in both of them. But let's just be a little conservative and say you split those. That's four and one. Then you've got the Patriots on the road, five and one. The Packers on the road and the Colts at home. Let's say you split those two. That's six and two. That's very doable. But that at Indianapolis game is a big key. I know it's week one, and I don't want to make too much of a week one game. You still got 16 left after that, but that's a big one. Also, Matthew, I realize I've gone beyond being short and sweet about this, but damn it, I love this shit. I think the next game that's a defining game, because again, you go through eight games um, where I think they go six and two. They've got a patch of schedule after that, week nine, 10, and 11, with three straight primetime games. Thursday night, Sunday night, Monday night, at New York, home Detroit, at Dallas. I'm going to put that at Dallas game as a defining game. I think for the mood of the fan base, I think as the capper to a tough three-game stretch, that I think I think that's the season-defining stretch right there, those three games. Because I think, I think the first half of the season is, is pretty easy. I think the back end of the season is very difficult, like the last four or five games, very difficult. And so you got those three Right there, you know, it, right there in the middle. Those, I, I think, those are going to define. I think two and one. You go two and one in those three primetime games, <clears throat> and I think you, you're in the mix. You potentially in the mix for the number one seed in the AFC at Dallas. That's the second one, um, and then I think two weeks after that, they they come home for Tennessee after the Dallas game. They play Tennessee on a short week. That that's at home. They should win that game. I don't care that it's a short week. They should win that game at Jacksonville. <clears throat> the next week is a tricky game because that's the second hardest division game behind at Indianapolis. And here's the thing about that game. If you've looked at the schedule, you know this already. The Texans will be playing their 13th straight game. Their bye week is the next week. So they're they're going to be playing their 13th straight game without a break. Jacksonville has a bye the week before that. So you get Jacksonville rested and the Texans having played 13 straight games. And that game is in Jacksonville. So if you're looking to go five and one in the division, you're going to have to win one of at Indy or at Jacksonville. So I'm putting them both in this conversation. And then the last two that are going to define the season at Kansas city week 16 on the 21st of December. And then four days later home for Baltimore. That's a defining four days right there, because those are the two teams that you're aspiring to be, especially Kansas city. I also think, and I said this on pain and Pendergast today, I wrote about this in the Houston press. If they beat Kansas City and Baltimore in those back-to-back -back games at KC and home for Baltimore, C.J. Stroud's going to win the MVP. He's going to win the MVP of the league. If they win those two games, it means they probably already had a pretty good first 15 games of the season. If they win those two games, it means they're good enough to go, you know, 11-4 uh, and four in the first 15 games of the season, or I guess there'd be 14 games up to that. So call it 10-4. and four. You sweep those games – you're 12 and four, and you got Tennessee in week 18. You're looking at 12 and five or 13 and four with CJ on a big stage, having just beaten Mahomes and Lamar Jackson. He is winning the MVP if he wins those two games. Book it. Bookmark this podcast, and you can come back at me and tell me I'm an idiot. But if they if they sweep those two games, CJ Stroud will be the MVP of the league. It's that simple. It's that tightly correlated. Okay. Matthew, fun exercise. Good job. Um, let's see here. Joe Q. Joe Q. Hypothetical here. If Nick announces before the opener at Indy that the Texans have extended Davis Mills for another year for eight million next year, fully guaranteed, how would you react? That's a great question. So Davis Mills is going to be a free agent after this year. And I think Davis Mills has a chance to make some money in free agency. Two years in the system. Clear cut back up now. None of this ambiguity with Case Keenum. 
I, I would say that even if Case were healthy, Davis just had a way better camp than Case. I think he's trusted now, Davis Mills, whereas last year, maybe not. Uh, Joe Q says, I checked quickly, and Tyrod and Mariota both make $6 million, uh, as backups on the teams they're on. Would you view it as a prudent investment in continuity or wasted money when they could draft a fourth rounder next year to back up CJ or take someone from the CJ Bethard aisle? Bethard's deal is a couple million bucks. When you frame it that way, $8 million sounds a little expensive. But again, CJ Stroud's still on a rookie contract next year. So... Um, I, I would be okay with it one year, 8 million for Davis mills. And you got your quarterback room all locked up for this year and next year. I'd be fine with it. I, I'm not pounding on the table for it, but I wouldn't say it was the dumbest thing in the world. Um, I'm guessing it's more likely that Davis would say no to that. If we do the old exercise, who says no, that's one of my favorites. Who says no, um, one year, 8 million for Davis mills to extend his contract one year. I think it's more likely mills says no. And then he looks to get a multi-year deal um, in free agency next year. You know, I, I think someone might pay Davis Mills, uh, you know, a couple of years, 18 million, something like that. 18, 20 million. Be a bridge guy. Sam Darnold got 10 million. Davis Mills is better than Sam Darnold. You heard me. Davis Mills is better than Sam Darnold fucking sucks. He sucks. Darnold got 10 million. Half of that is because he was a third overall pick. Don't ever tell me it doesn't matter where guys get drafted. Darnold sucks, dude. So if Darnold can get 10 million, Davis can get 10 million. All right. <laughs> Joe Q says if Davis moves on, the next backup QB might come from <laughs> Sam Darnold, Jameis, Jarrett Stidham, Derek Carr, who's playing in Kubiak's system this year, or Josh Dobbs. Um, I don't want anything to do with Josh Dobbs. I know he's super smart and he's got alopecia. That's not why I don't want him. I'm not an alopeciaist, okay? I'm just not a big Josh Dobbs guy. I don't think he's very good. I want nothing to do with Derek Carr. Derek, Someone's going to pay Derek Carr more than backup money again because this league is stupid. Um, I want nothing to do with Sam Darnold. Jameis would be a thrill to have on the team. I would kill to have Jameis Winston on this team for the press conferences alone. The one name... Before I even read this question about backup quarterbacks, and I've thought this for a while, that will I, I think has a good chance of being the backup for the Texans next year if Davis leaves is Jared Stidham. Um, he's you know he's from Texas, um, drafted by the Patriots when Casario was in the building there. Uh, he started a few games and actually played a few good games in the league. I think he's you know I, I know he's buried on the depth chart in Denver. Um, and I know Sean Payton handpicked him to come in last year. Um, uh, but Sean Payton, they're rolling with Bo Nix there. Like, the, unfortunately for Jared Stidham, like he's not, he's not in a spot where he can seize a starting role. So if he comes here, he's, he's, it's almost an admission that he's, he's a backup. I think part of the reason he went to Denver, in fact, I know part of the reason he went to Denver, um, is because he thought that was a starting position when Russ was there that might be available for the taking in Peyton's first year once Peyton fell out of love with Russell Wilson. And he was right. Russell ended up getting benched, but I guess, you know, I guess Jared, either A, Jared didn't do enough to take that job, or B, Sean Peyton is just that much in love with Bo Nix or a combination of the two. But, and for those who don't know, Jared is Tad Brown's son-in-law, former Rockets CEO, Tad Brown. So I've had the chance to meet Jared a few times. He's a great dude. I would love him on this team. That would be awesome. All right, a couple more, and then we'll uh, get on with the evening here. Uh, Fletcher in Austin. Domer question alert. Do you think Notre Dame transfer quarterback Riley Leonard will enter the 2025 draft? If so, where do you think he gets drafted? I do think he enters the draft, um, and I think that um, I think that I think he's got a chance to be a first-round pick. It's not a really strong um, quarterback class uh, this year. It's nothing like the class – this year. Um, so if you're watching on YouTube, I'm trying to pull up the yeah, Mike Denbrock. That's what I thought the name of the Notre Dame OC is. Um, Denbrock used to be at Notre Dame, but he was at LSU last year. Denbrock was the OC for Jaden Daniels. And if you watch Jaden Daniels play last year, like Jaden Daniels, he won the Heisman. Not sure if you guys know that. Ended up being number two overall pick. So this is the guy, same OC that had Jaden Daniels last year is going to be Riley Leonard's OC this year. Um, 
I think he's got a good chance to be a first round pick. I'm not a draft expert or anything like that. Um, the arm needs to, you know, needs to improve like the, you know, just the, the, the pure passing ability. He's an incredible athlete. He can really run. So in a weak quarterback class, I could see people falling in love with him. Now he has to have good year and it gets started this Saturday in college station against Texas A&M. That should be a whole lot of fun. Riley Leonard, Duke transfer to Notre Dame going against Mike Elko. Duke transfer to Texas A&M as a head coach. So uh, Fletcher also asked, whatever happened to Spencer Tillman calling the Texans preseason games? I love John Harris, but I always thought Tillman's unique style and eloquence was a fun preseason treat. Um, I don't know exactly, other than sometimes TV stations move on to different guys. They just want a, a different sound in the booth. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I like Tillman too. I like Spencer Tillman a lot. I like him personally. And I, I like him as a, as a commentator smoke through a keyhole, baby. Um, so I, yeah, I don't know what went on there. I think Johnny's excellent. I, you guys know, I mean, Johnny's been on this podcast. John, John Harris is one of my very best friends. Um, so I, I think Johnny is incredible. I think his knowledge is, is second to none. And I really loved seeing him get a chance to uh, call some games on channel 13 this year. I thought he and ND Kalu were a really, really nice combination. And Kevin Kugler's good too. That's not easy. A three man booth to find your spots. And I thought, I thought they all did a really good job um, of, of being unselfish. You know, that's not an easy thing to do. Not that I speak from experience, um, but I'm just as a, as a viewer, you know, I watch a lot of football as you can see right there. Watch a lot of football. Um, let's see. Let's move on. Chad in LA. <clears throat> Fletcher, thank you for the question. Chad in LA, first time writer, long time, <laughs> first time writer, long time listener. I just read the news that Stingley signed with Mulligetta. We as fans constantly worry that Mulligetta will do us dirty like he did with Deshaun. Now that he has Stingley and Stroud under his representation, I'm sure many fans are worried we might get another Watson episode. I'm sure the owners in the NFL don't want either. Under the current CBA, what power do owners have to keep Mulligetta slash athletes from pulling a Watson or has Watson's play probably killed any hope of that for the foreseeable future? I don't um, I don't think how Deshaun Watson's doing in Cleveland will has anything to do with the athlete side of it. I mean, af there's still going to be athletes that demand trades, get dissatisfied with how their team is run, don't like their coach, don't like the GM, don't see a future there, want to win, whatever. Jack Easterby's in the building, that kind of thing. Um, so guys, I guess the question is like, what's the appetite to trade for guys that are asking that are, that are agitating for a trade like that? Because Deshaun did it when the appetite was pretty high. Um, so maybe from that standpoint, I, I, I think a couple things here, <clears throat> let me first answer about Mulligetta and then I'll talk about trades in the league. Um, I think the Mulligetta thing is now overblown. I think Mulligetta trying to get Deshaun out of there had more to do with the Texans. And who knows, maybe Deshaun's personal situation that we didn't know a thing about at the time. Maybe Deshaun knew that the, the Grim Reaper, i.e. Tony Busby, was lurking around the corner. So I, I, I just think, even if Deshaun had no lawsuits coming, uh, do, you could understand Deshaun looking to get out of there, given the way the franchise was run at the time. It was a mess. Now, I, Deshaun might have been wise to give Nick Casario a chance to clean it up, but I get it. Like he, it could take three or four years to clean up that mess. It took two to clean up that mess. So I could see Deshaun not wanting to a burn daylight and b get his head handed to him like Matthew Stafford did for so many years in Detroit. Um, I just think the Texans are a they're just a much better run organization. Like to compare what Deshaun was asking out of to this is like comparing some gawky kid who's going through puberty with braces and crooked teeth and messed up hair and body odor to George Clooney. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, or, or one of the Hemsworths who ladies that listen, who are the other, who, who's the go-to these days for when you're trying to, trying to put together a metaphor that includes a hot dude. I, I don't, I'm, you know, I don't have a, an album in my phone of hot dudes or anything. Who's the go-to email H O U mailbag at gmail.com. I just need one lady to email. Like what's the go-to for that? Whoever it is, that's who the Texans are now. And I think Mulligetta sees this team as well run. 
Um, I actually talked to Mulligetta a little bit at the event that I did with CJ back in March while CJ was doing VIP stuff, taking pictures with rich people. Um, I talked to Mulligetta for a while and I, Mulligetta, when I was talking to him, like he liked the things that Nick was doing. This was right after uh, free agency. Um, I remember him saying the only thing that he was curious about was that they didn't address cornerback, which is interesting to me because he's the agent for the quarterback. You would think he, they hadn't made the digs trade yet at that point. That event was on March 26th. They made the digs trade a week later. So Mulligetta was already cool with the Texans off season, even before the digs trade. So again, I can't imagine that any quarterback, I, I can't imagine CJ looking around and seeing a better situation for him than the one that's here. Or Stingley, for that matter. The big thing with Stingley will be, will the Texans, assuming Stingley has a good season this year. Now, if he's not healthy again, then this will be a moot point. But if he's healthy and has a season like he had the last eight games of last year, then he, he, he's he got an argument to get a big contract extension. Will the Texans be inclined to do that? My feeling is, if I were, if Nick were wired like me, and fortunately for him, he's not, but if he were wired like me, he'd be really petty. and I, if I were Nick, I would be chomping at the bit to pay Derek Stingley Jr. because it would be proof that I got that pick right. All you Sauce Gardner fuckheads out there, Sauce is a good player, but come on, Stingley's pretty good too. So, um, so that that would be I if if I were Nick, I'd be like, man, I can't wait to pay this guy so I can shove it up everybody's ass. So, um, now as far as the other thought that I had on this. I think there's just fewer teams that are willing to make the trade like the Browns did, where they're giving up a, a just a ton of draft capital for the right to overpay a guy. Uh, the Devontae Adams trade, the, the Laramie Tunsil trade, if we're being honest, um, the Tyreek Hill trade. Now, some of these trades have worked out. The Devontae Adams, Devontae's been good, but it hasn't worked out for the Raiders. They're not good. Um, the Tyreek Hill trade, Tyreek's been amazing. He's, I think Tyreek is the most valuable non-quarterback in all of football hasn't pushed the dolphins over the top or anything like that, you know, and now they've got to pay Tua. And so that cheap labor you get from those draft picks doesn't exist because you gutted your draft. So I think teams, I think you saw it like with so few of the receivers, there are plenty of receivers that could have been on the move this off season. Um, Brandon Ayuk is still sitting out there. I just think teams aren't willing to give up multiple high picks for guys anymore. Brian Burns is probably the closest example he went for a two and a five. You know, I think in two years ago, he would have gone for two ones. But I think teams are realizing it's stupid to trade away two ones for the right to clog up your salary cap, even with good players. So I, that's why I think I, that's what Mulligetta, I, I'm not worried about Mulligetta and the Texans uh, at all. All right, two more. Dave and Round Rock. I know this email will get you before the Texans have cut down the roster. <laughs> Dave, you're wrong. Um, and well, the email got to me before that, but I'm reading it after. And your next utopia will drop after the cuts. Okay, sorry about that, Dave. <laughs> Should have read the whole sentence. Uh, I want to point out that Damian Pierce's great 2022 season was when D'Amico was the DC with the 49ers. So I think Dave's point is that why you know why is D'Amico so in love with Damian Pierce? He's never even been here for good Damian Pierce football. Um also, this is Dave talking. The phrase I've seen enough of dot 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 doesn't usually indicate a ringing endorsement. I predict Damien is gone. Am I wrong? I can answer that now. You are wrong, Dave. As of right now, you are wrong. I again, I'll repeat. I still think there's a chance that Damien, I think a good chance that Damien gets traded. Um, and and the teams that are looking to move draft capital for Damien Pierce are just waiting to see what the waiver wire looks like, you know, and see if there's a a a solution where they don't have to give up a, a day three pick or something like that. I think there's a good chance Damien's still on the move. I right, last one, Brian in Iowa. By the time you get this, it's it may be after the 53 is decided, and we may know which jerseys may be discounted in the fan shop. I don't know that anybody got let go today whose jersey was in the fan shop. Now, I'll say this, and Brian, I'll get to the rest of your email, I promise. Um, if Damian Pierce's jerseys are discounted in the store, in the team store, you should go check this out. Then something is afoot. And I say that because um, back in 2011, um, me and my then girlfriend, now wife, Amy, and my kids all went up to Dallas for the day during the summertime when my, kid, my kids were in town from Chicago. So we went up to Dallas to take a tour of, AT&T Stadium 
and do some other things as well. And we went in the team store and Marion Barber, by the way, very similar running style to Damian Pierce, Marion Barber jerseys were discounted like 75%. And this was during the, um, during the lockout. So it was almost like, okay, well, we know as soon as the lockout's over, we know who's getting cut. That guy, Marion Barber. And sure enough, he did. So yeah, we'll have to check. Are Damian Pierce, somebody go to the team store and let me know. At Sean T. Pendergast, or Damian Pierce jerseys uh, on discount. All right, uh, the rest of Brian's email. Since Pierce was held out of the last preseason game, could it be possible that Ryans and Casario are scheming something? The answer is yes. It's very possible they're trying to trade him. While I'm hopeful a trade was in the works, what are the chances that he was told to stutter at the line or slow down when returning a kick just to let him absolutely go off in the regular season? And you're referring back to that kickoff in the Giants game where Damian just kind of stopped in front of the crowd. I think zero chance. I think Damian's in his own head right now, and it's, it sucks. It sucks to see. Brian says, I'm picturing Casario sitting on top of a horse as Maximus and Gladiator on my signal, unleash hell. Looking forward to seeing what happens in Indy. Strength and honor. Go Texans. Brian, appreciate it. All right. Quick reminder, bottom of the screen right there, H-O-U mailbag at gmail.com. Ian O'Connor interview podcast later this week. It's 20 minutes. It's a quick listen, but it's really interesting Aaron Rodgers stuff because um, I'm going to be traveling. I've got some family business to uh, to attend to Thursday and Friday this week. I'll be off the air as well. Brandon Scott will be in for me on Payne and Pendergast on Thursday and Friday this week. So with that said, subscribe, rate, review, always the three words, the three magic podcast words, subscribe, rate, review. We, we always appreciate that. And um, that's it. Out of time. Astros game about to start in about 30 minutes. So um, I will see all of you um, next time. We'll be next week. Send me some emails. Let's get some good emails in. Let's start looking ahead at the season. I'll give you some predictions next week in the mailbag. Ask me what you want me to predict. If it's prop bets or the you know divisions or whatever, um, send them in, mailbag at gmail.com. So until next week, I appreciate everybody tuning in. This has been the Utopia Football Podcast. We will talk again soon.